Apophi, or Nal. His brothers are Bailist and Hellblindy. Loki is beautiful and comely to look upon, evil in spirit, very fickle in habit. He surpassed other men in that wisdom which is called slight, as in sleight of hand, and had artifices for all occasions. He would ever bring the Aesir into great hardships and then get them out with crafty counsel. His wife was called Sigan, their son Nari or Narfi. So, <laughs> most of us, when we make this transition from a monotheistic or Abrahamic faith, the knee jerk reaction with any kind of basic cursory examination of history is that, well, this was written by Christians and they and they've made some kind of modification on this and the knee jerk reaction is to always make the claim that well they're trying to make loki into the devil one of the things we're going to do here tonight is go through this lore and have a presentation on the idea that that's not the case that's that's not the case at all we loki is not a heathen personification of the devil and i'll tell you why for the most part, most of the actions that Loki exemplify in the lore, <coughs> stop, take it somewhere else. He is he's exemplifying the attitudes and actions of an individual who is thoroughly possessed of his own self-image. His ego is out of control. He is the uninspired human intellect who, though he has a seat at the table, cannot bring himself to live up to or measure up to a standard. It says there he's the chief mischief, he's the mischief monger of the Aesir and the first father of falsehoods and a blemish of all gods and men. A blemish with regards to the devil and monotheism, he's that scapegoat. Anytime something goes wrong, anytime someone messes up, anytime someone fails to live up to a standard, they have someone to blame. They have the devil made me do it kind of mentality or the devil's working against me. Or there's something bad going on with the devil. He's really trying hard, but I'm going to pray and it's not, it's, we're going to get it to all go away. It's always something out there that you can blame for whatever's going on in your life. The entirety of Osetru is a 180 degree change in direction from that monotheistic chain of thought. Monophysic change of thought is that something out there is going to fix what's in here. Something out there is going to do for me what I can't do for myself, so on and so forth. And when you fail, it gives you someone to blame. Now, in also true, we have all of these the nine noble virtues. We must be industrious. We must be self-reliant. We must persevere. We must have courage and honesty, <laughs> hospitality, generosity. All of these things that originate from the efforts of the individual. We're not waiting on a handout from our gods. And anytime I hear someone say, well, I stand before my gods. Have you developed yourself to the point where you're worthy of standing in front of your gods? Is it respectful to be that individual who is still willing to blame something else for their problems to stand in front of their gods? I ask myself that question often. With regards to Loki, we have this individual who's good looking. He's got him a nice wife. And yet he cannot help himself but to be the father of falsehoods. Now, like all the rest of the Aesir, his mother and father are of giant stock. If you look at all of the other Aesir, all of the other gods and goddesses, they all do something that Sigurd does. They all do something that the first generation of children in the Greek school do. They learn from, they capitalize on, they develop, they shed some of that learning they received from their parents so they can become something more. Tyr, and especially, is, is, a, is of a giant stock. Thor, the, the guard, the warder of men, helps this individual go back to his father's home and secure his heritage this mile wide kettle that they might brew this mead in odin billy and bay odin makes sacrifice after sacrifice to become worthy of being the ruler of asgard they all continue to develop themselves 
they all continue to become something more than they were by unlearning and learning new things. And yet we never see that from Loki. Anytime he's presented with a challenge, anytime he's presented with a standard to measure up to, or anytime this good looking man gets more attention to the guy next to him, he kills him. Or if it's the warder of men and she's a truly beautiful woman, well, he rapes her. That theft of her hair, that that very image of femininity, that is not he just set up, he just snuck up there and cut off her hair. This is a rape of a, of a goddess. These are the actions of the uninspired human intellect. These are the actions of the individual, much like us, who is trying to figure it out. Loki's that example of the individual who never tries to figure it out. Next chapter, yet more children had Loki. Anger Boda. Anger Boda means the one who brings sorrow or the one who brings suffering or the one who brings grief, she who offers suffering. So the uninspired human intellect, seeing that he can't quite measure measure up, though he has a wife and a son there with the Aesir, instead of measuring up in the good standards of being a, 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 a reliable companion, a worthy companion, he slips off into the woods in Jotunheim with Angerboda, and he had three children. One is the Fenris wolf, who is a constant threat to the Aesir with a gluttonous appetite, Tyr, their greatest warrior, the grandfather in many cases, in many respects, according to some archaeological evidence of the Aesir, lost his hand to him. The second, Jormungandr, that is the Midgard serpent. That is the efforts of the world itself that creates such a hazardous environment for men to live in. Be it a volcano, an earthquake, a tidal wave, whatever. It is a powerful indicator. Think about the tidal, the tidal wave that hit Thailand few years ago, 250,000 people dead in an instant. These are the shrugs of Yorman circled the world. And it helps us to remember that our grip to life on this planet is not something we can always take for granted, yet many of us do. The third is hell. But when the gods learned that this kindred was nourished in Jotunheim, when the gods perceived by prophecy that from this kindred great misfortune should befall them, and since it seems to all that there were great prospects of ill, first from the mother's blood, and yet worse from the father's blood, then all father sent gods thither to take the children and bring them to him, and when they came to him straightway he cast the serpent into the deep sea, where he lies about all the land, and this serpent grew so greatly that he lies in the midst of the ocean encompassing all the land, and bites upon his own tail. Hell he cast into Niflheim, who gave her, gave to her power over nine worlds, to apportion all abodes among those that were sent to her, that is, men dead of sickness or of old age. She has great possessions there. Her walls are exceeding high, and her gates great. Her hall is called sleek, cold, her dish, hunger, famine is her knife, idler, her thrall, sloven, her maidservant, Pit of stumbling her threshold by which one enters. Disease her bed, gleaming bale her bed hangings. She is half blue and half flesh colored by which she is easily recognized and very lowering and fierce. There's a lot to be said about that. Hell, this sun facing goddess that has two characteristics to her. One is a beautiful, comely, sun-facing, lovely goddess that welcomes people into the afterlife. The other is this dark and mysterious kind of cold who worms in the dark earth and the mysteries of the burial mound aspect of her. If you wanted to take a faith from some individual, one of the first things you would do would be to vilify how they perceive the afterlife you would make a threatening and terrible visage of that which ruled the underworld to which so many people went. Now, hell is not the child of Loki. 
she is a much, much older goddess. She's been around since the dawn of goddesses being around. Some aspect of divine femininity that escorts people to the next realm has always been present. But let's say you are one of these egotistical individuals who seeing you can't blossom under the current power structure, so you decide to slink off into the dark woods, have an affair with some other nasty hoe, and bring into the world these ugly things that are a very threat to the stability of everything we hold dear. If you lived a life according to those kind of principles, which visage do you think you would see when you come to that gate that we're all walking to? that one last passageway into the afterlife, which visage do you think would entertain or, or welcome us into the next realm? Do you think it would be the bright and lovely sun-facing goddess? Or do you think it would be that dark and corrupt mysteries of the earth and burial mound as we've lived a life of dishonor, of shame, where we have caused innumerable pains on individuals that are supposed to love us, are supposed to care for us? we failed to measure up to the expectations of our own minds and hearts, not to mention what everyone else thought we should become, which visage would you be greeted by? In that paragraph, there is a warning. There's a literal warning here of how we should live life. There's a literal warning here of what it's going to look like if we decide to sacrifice this faith of 10,000 years for this newfangled faith of 2,000 years. The idea of Helheim and governs all abodes, these are the halls of our ancestors. And if we look at Baldur's Tale, we, we see that he sits on the high seat in that underworld, according to, according to Hell's wishes. See if I can find it again. Gave to her power over nine worlds to apportion all abodes among those that were sent to her, that is, men dead of sickness or of old age. She has great possessions there. That means everybody else. That doesn't mean the girls that die of virgins, they belong to Gephi. That doesn't mean the men that drown at sea, they belong to Ram. That doesn't mean the heroes that are the men that die on the foreign battlefield and are buried in the mass grave. The Valkyries collect them up and take them to Valhalla, Bengal, for folk. There are various heavens for these various unique individuals that venture forth or hold something sacred for the community from which they originate. Everyone else has to deal with that all roads lead to Rome. We all are walking one path, all heading towards this one gate we have to pass through to join our ancestors in the halls or the abodes that hell has appointed to them. And then on down to Misty Hell, past Helheim, past Niflheim is down to Misty Hell. That is the ninth realm. That's where the murderers go and the deceivers of men's wives. That's where much as Loki is deceiving his wife with this affair he's having, trying to create his own version of Asgard, and all he does with his egotistical ideas is create the monsters that will destroy the world. <laughs> Every time I see a man hit a midlife crisis and decides to start entertaining ideas of a woman about half his age, I see that same mindset taking root. He's gonna slide off over here and start a new family and try it again and I don't usually see positive results come out of that. There's an opportunity for growth there to be sure. But if you've already skated out of the tough ordeal of building a relationship once, well, why wouldn't you just do it again? It'd be easier. Now his partner, Sigan, which his name means girlfriend, she has to make sacrifices as well. And we'll get into that shortly. So we have this we have this real unique individual in Loki in that right off the bat, we see how his progeny or the attitudes by which he lives really affects how we build the success in our own lives. It reminds us that we need to step out of our own thought process every now and again 
to really step up to the plate. Because many times if we continue on trying to reinvent the wheel as it were with as he did with anger boda and all he did was create the monsters that destroy the world because he wouldn't make that sacrifice to measure up in a system that was providing abundance and a golden age for every other being in that in that location the beings that had made the sacrifices of self to become something better to step up to the plate that take care of each other that live by basically nine noble virtues the one individual who could not do that he sows the seeds of destruction for everyone else. Speaking of sowing that seed of destruction, there is another seed that he sows. Okay. If I can find it, and sure enough, I can't. So if you'll bear with me, I'll find this tale of Baldwin. Does anyone have any questions so far while I search for this? Well, I guess I'm not supposed to talk about it, so I got something else. <laughs> As we go through the Gofanganing, we come across the next thing that he does. Sleipnir, the horse Sleipnir. Who owns that horse Sleipnir, or what is to be said of him? Our answer, thou hast no knowledge of Sleipnir's points. And thou knowest not the circumstances of his begetting, but it will seem to thee worthy the telling. It was early in the first days of the gods dwelling here when the gods had established the Midgard and made Valhalla. So they've built their golden age. They have established a heaven for the heroes of the battlefield. And there came at that time a certain rite and offered to build them a citadel in three seasons, so good that it could be staunch and proof against the hill giants and the rhyme giants, those that, though they should come in over Midgard. But he demanded his wages that he should have possession of Freya, and would fain have the sun and the moon. So this guy's got a pretty high price tag. He's pretty proud of his facts. He may not have done any anything ever, but he's going to secure for himself that fountain of love. He thinks that hard work will, that'll be sufficient. Just a little bit of hard, I'm work hard every day. I ought to get all the love I need when I come home. And my wife needs to give me the sun and the moon. Oh, how so? There's some things that need to happen with men other than just working hard to secure these all these gifts of love and the sun and the moon and breakfast in bed and dinner on the table when you get to the house. Yet this individual can't seem to figure it out. But he's going to ask for it. He's going to work hard for it. On the first day of summer, if any part of the citadel was left unfinished, he should lose his reward, and he was so to, he was to receive help from no man in the work. When they told him these conditions, he asked that they would give him leave to have the help of his stallion, which is called Zvadalfari, and Loki advised it so that the rights petition was granted. He set to work the first day of winter to make the citadel, and by night he had hauled the stones with the stallion's aid, and it seemed very marvelous to the Aesir that great rocks that horse drew. For the horse did more rough, rough work by half than did the right. But there were strong witnesses to their bargain and many oaths, since it seemed unsafe to the giant to be among the Aesir without truce if Thor should come home. But Thor had then gone away into the eastern region to fight trolls. I hate to digress, but that comes up again and again. Where is the eastern region where Thor goes to fight trolls? How many times have I seen that come up? Thor is off in the east fighting trolls. Thor is away in the east. Where is east? What's out there? Now when the winter drew nigh unto its end, the building of the citadel was far advanced, and it was so high and strong that it could not be taken. When it lacked three days of summer, the work had almost reached the gate of the stronghold. Then the gods sat down in their judgment seats and sought means of evasion, and asked one another who had advised giving Freya into Jotunheim, or so destroying the air and the heaven as to take thence the sun and the moon and give them to the giants. The gods agreed that they must have counseled this who is wont to give evil advice, Loki Laufersson, and they declared him deserving of an ill death. If he could not hit upon a way of losing the right, his wages, and they threatened Loki with violence. So this individual, this uninspired human intellect, this father of lies, this deceiver and chief backbiter of the gods, come upon an idea that he's going to build the walls of Asgard, he's going to do something great, but he's not going to do it himself. 
And like several other stories that he's involved in, he offers something that's not his. And he puts at risk the entire community. Now, everybody wants to point out, oh, well, yeah, but he, he saved everybody. He, he brought it all out and made everything okay. His, uh, his actions actually led to a benefit for the gods. You know, if we sit back and start thinking that, well, whatever, whatever our actions might be, if the outcome's okay, well, it's really justified. What kind of life are we going to live? Who are we going to be greeted by at that door when we cross into that next realm? What kind of honor would we be accorded if our actions were poisonous, deceitful, harmful, shameful? If we broke the hearts of women and men just so that, the, well, the result's going to be okay. You got to crack a few eggs, you know, all that nonsense. There's no honor in that. There's nothing worth according honor in that. And yet again and again, we see that people would flock to his banner, as it were, because, well, the outcome, came, it came out all right, didn't it? He was the impetus for it. He was the engine of change. He was the, he was the what? All of these things fail at the final moment. Every reward given failed at the end of all things. The hammer, the horse, the sword, the ship, the spear, all of it fails at the end of that. It's at the moment when you need them most, just because they were forged in a lie and of deceit, they're not going to hold true. The same thing can be said for our lives. How can we forge powerful, positive lights worthy of sharing our might and main with those around us if we're going to take a shortcut, if we're going to cheat somebody else, if we're going to try to go off on our own and reinvent the wheel because, well, I don't feel really like this and I don't understand, and, you know, for God, they're not really real. And it's okay, and that oath doesn't really mean much. Because that's the exact attitude we're being warned against with this individual in this Lord. These are the kind of actions of Christian men against pagan kings. This is very much a warning of what it would look like if we fall victim to that idea that something out there is gonna take care of it for us. These gods listened to him and he spoke his words in their ears and offered what seemed like sound advice and offered something that, well, he can't do it, but we'll offer him the sun and the moon and the very bosom of love herself and it'll be okay. Well, now everything is at risk. This is the first action where he threatens to remove the light of the world from the people. The second action is when he encourages Blind Hoder to take that shot at Bolt. So the sun and the moon, day and night, all of it is at risk. And they're going to kill him. But when he became frightened, then he swore oath that he would so contrive that the right should lose his wages and cost him what it might. That same evening, when the right drove out the stone with the stallion, Zvaldifari, a mare bound forth from a certain wood and whinnied at him. The stallion, perceiving what manner of horse this was, straightway became frantic, snapped the trace of the thunder, leaped over to the mare, and she away to the wood, and the right after striving to seize the stallion. These horses ran all night, and the right stopped there that night, and afterward a day the work was not done as it had been before. When the right saw the work could not be brought to an end, he fell into a giant's fury. Now that the Aesir saw surely that the hill giant was come thither, they did not regard their oaths reverent, but called on Thor, who came as quickly and straightway the hammer Mjolnir was raised aloft. He paid the right's wage, and not with the sun and the moon, nay, he even denied him dwelling in Jotunheim and struck him but the one first blow, so that his skull was burst in the small crumbs and sent him down below under Niflheim. Loki had such dealings with Svaldifari that somewhat later he gave birth to a foal which was gray and had eight feet. And this horse is the best among gods and men. So it is said in the Volus, but then all the powers go to the seats of judgment, the most holy gods council held together, who had the air all with evil and venom, or to the Eden race, odors made and given. Broken were oaths, oaths then, bond and swearing, pledges all sacred, when pa which passed between them. Thor alone smote there, swollen with anger. He seldom sits still when he hears of such. <laughs> if you're associating with an individual who will 
create those kind of situations where you're put in a position of life or death of your oath. Is this someone you want to hang out with? Is this someone you want to be associated with? Is this the kind of action that will enrich, deepen, and embolden our spiritual growth? Probably not. We can't go around breaking these oaths willy-nilly. At some point, if we're going to live this life, if we're going to call ourselves Oscar, at some point, we've got to take a good long look at what we're taking an oath to. Are we taking an oath to an individual who simply wants to be right? Are we offering the sun and the moon and the bosom of love uh, so we might be on equal footing with someone who's been doing this for 50 years or has a successful business or has a healthy relationship with their wife and their children? We've got to be asking ourselves these very serious questions because these are the literally the foundations of what we would consider to be our faith. And here we have this warning. When, when an individual must change who they are in order to help you get out of an oath or break an agreement or literally change the sex and identity to who and what they are in order to ensure the safety of or cover up or protect some lie that they've made, you've got to ask yourself, what's really going on here? If I have to change myself so much that you can't recognize me so that I might stand on my own feet and back up some lie that somebody else is putting forward, is there any honor in it? Is there any kind of honor to be accorded to the individual that would literally change his sex because he... Oh, what is so radical that you would have to do something like this? This is not the path of growth. This is not a path that enables us to become what we want to become. And it continues on. When he goes on the journey with uh, Thor and Uthgard Loki, he has a little competition. And this is where the reference to him being known as Wildfire comes up. Loki's going to have a competition and eat against some cat or something like that. <laughs> Entirety of the Lord is, is, is all about these individuals that make sacrifices to become something more. They make sacrifices of things that are holding them back. Loki can't do this. And there are a few places where it's more evident than in the death of Baldur. Then said Gangleri, have any more matters of note befallen among the Aesir? A very great deed of, Thor, of valor did Thor achieve on that journey, Harman answered. Now shall be told of those tidings which seemed of more consequence to the Aesir. The beginning of the story is this, that Baldur the Good dreamed great and perilous dreams touching his life. When he told these dreams to the Aesir, then they took counsel together, and this was their decision, to ask safety for Baldur from all kinds of danger. And Brig took oaths to this purport, that fire and water should spare Baldur, likewise iron and metal of all kinds, stones, earth, trees, sicknesses, beasts, birds, venoms, and serpents. When that was done and made known, then it was a diversion of Baldur's and the Aesir that he should stand up in the thing and all others should shoot, should some shoot at him, some hew at him, and some beat him with stones. But whatsoever was done hurt him not at all, and that seemed to them all a very worshipful thing. It's interesting that they say worshipful. You have to ask yourself, so Balder and Frigg have made these sacrifices to become the king and queen of Asgard, to rule this kingdom that they have built with their own hands. And they have their first son. The first son of the couples in the Rigsthula, who represent some of the better aspects of those grandparents and great-grandparents and mother and father. If the father was a skilled woodcarver, well, the son would become a great craftsman. Now, Odin is a, is a king of Asgard. He is the ruler. He is the all-father. 
He set all of this in motion. He's put all this together. His son, Balder, lives in that home where fewest baneful runes lie, and none may gainsay his judgments. So from the king, we have the first son who has, who really kind of epitomizes this idea of justice. When a free man might live in a society where they might understand that the cornerstone of what they believe in, uh, they might have a fair day in court. They might have laws that allow them to become who they're supposed to become. They might have a legal system they can trust in and believe in. There's literally a goddess that is the public defender. There's another god that offers fair judgment in Forseti. Balder and Anna's son is another literal cornerstone for the foundations of a civilized free society of men who can become what they want to become. You cannot generate the hospitality and generosity that you see that you see remarked upon by Tacitus if you don't live in a society where you understand and believe in the rule of law that Forseti and Balder epitomize. A cornerstone of every great civilization is the legal system that they that they promote. But here we are with some confusion about it. All of a the sudden, these gods are again involved in the affairs of men, and one of the corner, one of the chief ideas that they have is the all thing, the Dana Law, which found, which was the precursor to the Magna Carta, which was the precursor to the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution. It all harkens back to these equality, these ideas of law. The uninspired human intellect takes a great disinterested view of this. All right, nobody needs to tell me no law. You ain't going to tell me what to do with blah, blah, blah. So once again, we find that this uninspired human intellect, this individual that has a seat at the table, but for the life of him, cannot figure out how to justify that, grow into it, or become worthy. So not only has he snuck off to try to recreate something and created the monsters that destroy the world, now he's going to take a shot at that thing that allows free men to enjoy their freedom, and that being the rule of law, that home that knows the fewest painful runes where none may gainsay his judgments because they're going to be good for everybody. When Loki Laufusson saw this, it pleased him ill that Balder took no hurt. Why? Who does he think he is? How can he get out there and do all that stuff? I've seen a lot of men that get real tied up because some other guy's doing better than they are. Usually it shows up as water cooler office gossip. You see the kind of backstabbing and bickering online. I've seen all kinds of people say all kinds of things about me, but they won't take the efforts necessary to measure up to some of the things I've done. And there are other men that have done far greater things than I have. And I do not begrudge them. Now all of a sudden, I've got a goal. I've got something to strive for. I've got a faith that helps me believe in myself to go and achieve that thing. I live in a society that happens to be free enough where I might go and try it of my own will. If I want to start a business, I can. If I want to change my job, I can. If I want to learn something, I carry the world's knowledge on a device in my palm of my hand. I have the freedom to do it. All of these wonderful things are part and parcel of what our faith delivers to men on this planet. And the uninspired human intellect has an issue with that. And the first thing he does is sneak off to Fensalir. He went to Fensalir to Prig and made himself into the likeness of a woman. Once again, in order to achieve a goal that he doesn't agree with, instead of standing on his own two feet as a man, and taking issue with it and arguing it at the all thing, he begins his deceit and he changes his sex. He becomes someone else. He puts on a facade. He lies. <laughs> then Frigg asked if that woman knew what the Aesir did at the thing. She said that all were shooting at Balder, and moreover, that he took no hurt. Then said Greg, neither weapons nor trees may hurt Balder. I have taken oaths of them all. Then the woman asked, have all things taken oaths to spare Balder? And Frigg answered, there grows a tree sprout alone westward of Valhall. It is called mistletoe. And I thought it too young to ask the oath of. And then straightway the woman turned away, but Loki took mistletoe and pulled it up 
and went to the thing. Here we have an interesting dynamic. Not only do we have the individual who would engage in the character assassination of men he cannot keep with, measure up to, or even want to try, we have that individual as Hoder stood outside the ring of men because he was blind. Then spake Loki to him, why dost thou not shoot at Balder? He answered, because I see not where Balder is, and for this also that I am weaponless. One of the other things that a faith, foreign faith, might wish to do is they will start with the fringe element of society. The outcast, the downtrodden, the in pain, the junkies, the alcoholics, those individuals who are blind to the workings of the world and do not fit into society and whisper in their ears that, well, I can do this for you. Why don't you join in? Whisper these things that, that the disenfranchised will grab a hold of so they might feel like they're a part of something again. And the church's primary target for those that needed to be forgiven the most. So here we have a blind man standing at the edge of the crowd, looking in on society and having all its fun at the at the, at the protected foundation of justice for free men at the all thing, that very cornerstone that ensures freedom and whatever else. If you look at any of the great wars, if you look at any of the radical movements, and I don't care if it's socialism, communism, um, Antifa, I don't care if it's any of those ideas, you have a group of individuals who do not fit in who cannot measure up in society, who do not have what it takes. They need that factory job. They have no idea how to go out and start a business. They won't try to learn. They would rather sit around and complain about it. They'll watch the evening news and go on a 30 minute tirade to their spouse about why if they would let me do this, but in the morning they'll, they'll punch that alarm clock, get up, drive to work and hit that. Why if I had a million dollars, I'll tell you what I'd do. And this is the kind of individual in all of these radical movements in these various societies. They're fighting communism. There's an enemy to hate. There's something. These people that cannot look into society and figure out how to succeed in it. There is a message being whispered into their ear that, well, if you'll take a shot at this, if you'll shoot that group of people over there or this individual over here, or if you'll take a shot at that guy, you have the opportunity to steal the light of their world. And in this instance, it happens to be the cornerstone of justice for gods and men alike at the all thing itself, the unassailable fortress that allows free men to succeed. And the same thing is happening on a greater or lesser degree. This is the very essence of that uninspired human intellect whispering at someone else to do the dirty work because, well, I can't really do it either, but I can get that guy to be the stool pigeon or the patsy and risk his future for this idea, get them fired up for the cause. Well, you need to go out and strike against that person. You need to get out to the street. You need to fight, you need to throw rocks and blah, blah, blah. And you need to kill the communists. You need to kill the socialists. And we need... That's the kind of message that uninspired human intellect is whispering into the ears of youths and people that stand at the fringes of society. And some people say, well, that I really understand. Okay, in the Hebrew worldview, I highly doubt. Because that very basic idea that ensures our success is what they are all taking a shot at. <laughs> do thou also after the manner of other men and show Balder honor as the other men do. I will direct thee where he stands. Shoot at him with his wand. Hoder took Mr. Poe and shot at Balder. Being guided by Loki, the shaft flew through Balder and he fell dead to the earth. And that was the greatest mischance that has ever befallen among gods and men. And it still holds true today that the greatest mischance that has ever befallen gods and men is that someone is whispering into the ears of someone else to get them to do their dirty work because, well, I'm here to help you and we'll take a shot at this because this is a worshipful thing. This is the right thing to do for freedom and democracy and the right people to need to take. See, they consider this assault upon Balder as a worshipful thing because this was the unassailable foundation of justice. 
that great shining example of what it means to be the centered, well-rounded individual, shining and good in all things, where fewest baneful runes lie in his home. And yet, this individual is whispering in their ear that, well, since everybody else is worshiping that way, here's a half truth. Let's take a little shot with this and see what happens. And this is what Christianity did to all of the downtrodden, disenfranchised homeless. They offered regular men the opportunity to become war, you know, hold positions of power in medieval Europe and that rivaled kings and queens. To become a bishop or a cardinal for a regular man who outside of royalty, well, that was quite a pass, wasn't it? You could have been a beggar in the street with no understanding of how the world works at all. And in five years' time, you could have been a bishop sitting in a royal court offering counsel to a king who is raised with no benefit. Hell, it's no wonder it went. Now, in this free world we live in, we have the same kind of people, those individuals that have usually spent their lives screwing up, think they got it figured out. Now they're going to tell others, we really need to do this for the cause and to ensure the Western civilization doesn't fall, and we're going to take a shot. Oh? What are you going to do when you rob the light of the world from a whole group of people? Because that's just what happened. The greatest mischance that has ever befallen among gods and men. We're at that same crossroads today. <laughs> Exceeding much Loki had brought to pass when he had first been that cause that Balder was slain, and then that was not redeemed out of hell. Was any vengeance taken on him for this? Our answer, this thing was repaid him in such wise that he shall remember it long. When the gods had become as wroth with him as was to be looked for, he ran off and hid himself in a certain mountain. There he made a house with four doors so that he could see out of the houses in all directions. Often throughout the day, he turned himself into the likeness of a salmon and hid himself in the place called Franninger Falls. Then he would ponder what manner of wild the gods would devise to him in the waterfall. But when he sat in the house, he took twine of linen and did meshes as a net is made of since, but a fire burnt before him. Then he saw that the issue was close upon him, and Odin had seen from Lidskjall where he was. He leaped up at once and out into the river, but cast the net into the fire. When the Aesir had come to the house, he went in first, who was wisest of all, who was called Kvasir. And Kvasir is going to be one of the more interesting talks I give for the sermon. At any rate, this individual who is sowing deceit is the guy that's always looking over his shoulder because of something he said or something he did. He changes his form into something slippery and lives his life in fear. These individuals that we see that spread this kind of deceit, anger and hatred towards ideas that are trying to hold us down and keep us back, or we're not going to succeed, or this is all bad, and it's a racist, sexist, foul pig, and all this all of these other negative things that people spew out. They're spewing out because they sit in a house that has four doors. They're always looking for something to be offended by. And when an individual lives a life like that, they're looking, they're looking over their shoulder, they're trying to find a reason to be offended, they're spreading half-truths and deceit. That's not much of a life. How can we sit here on solid ground and say that this individual might really represent a good thing because, well, he gave some gifts later on. If you're always looking for the next thing to be offended by, if you're always trying to find that thing to really get you fired up so you can get all these other people fired up, the only thing most people in that state of mind are doing are substituting those ideas of righteous indignation for spiritual development. It's a hard thing to unlearn. But you can watch the nightly news and see it before it swing. Switch between CNN and Fox. You'll see some aspect of that chaos element woven into our society to keep people fired up, righteously indignant. And from that, they will draw their identity. As a faith, for us to offer something legitimate to this world, how do we help those people let go of that? Because once you've done it long enough, 
or once you've been a victim long enough, there's a very real fear amongst individuals dealing with the pain caused by living that lifestyle, be it drug addiction, be it a survivor of an abuse, be it an abused spouse, be it a politically righteous, politically righteous indignant or spiritually righteously indignant. What happens to that individual when they let that go and they no longer get that attention that they've got all their life? What happens to them? Why, this is a really scary proposition. This is why I call it uninspired. One of the most fascinating principles of faith is that all of these gods give us examples of what happens when we let go of those things to become something more. Freya loses a husband and raises two beautiful children anyway. Tyr sacrifices a hand and still offers wise counsel to, to all of the Aesir. Odin sacrifices an eye. Riga loses a son. Sif is abused and raped. All of these gods go through something. Heimdall sacrifices an ear to see all things. Odin sacrifices an eye to know all things. All of these gods have done something. If we cannot use our faith to help people set those ideas aside and get them to understand that there's so much more than what are we doing? The premise of Loki in these tales is that linchpin that will allow us to create ideas to help people move beyond the things that caused them pain in their life. To get them out of the rut that brought them to a crossroads where they had to change the foundation of their faith to begin with. I wonder if you see how important and powerful what this tale really means is. There's a true, there's a true freedom involved in getting away from that. That's what we find in approach for SETI. And once again, build that civilization that has justice for free men in a society. Free of that righteously indignant idea, the manipulation, much as Reagan manipulated Sigurd throughout his life to kill Fafnir, who had literally nothing to do with it. Half truths and lies manipulated yet another man by a greedy individual so he might take action he could not or would not. It's a commonly repeated theme throughout the prose and the poetic edit. Now, if I can find it, I'd like to get to Well, I can't find it. There are two more episodes that, that bear the key. One is the assault upon Sif. One is the rape of the goddess of the harvest, Sif, the wife of Thor, the mother of Uli. <laughs> when he snuck upon her and stole her golden hair, this goddess, this divine feminine of the community, Loki has to produce great gifts for all of the gods, all of the Aesir. They're going to judge and see which gift is best. And I'll be danged if he doesn't try to cheat himself out of that too. He turns into a fly and bites him on the nose and on the hand and tries to screw everything up. And old, but Odin gets Gungnir and Thor gets Mjolnir and Frey gets a ship that I cannot pronounce for the life of me that he can fold up. It is the best of all ships. And Sif gets her golden hair. The neat thing that we need to pay attention to is in that society, when one individual wrapped up in his own selfish desires, needs, and greeds assaults just one member of that feminine member of that community, he owes shield to the entire community. Not just to Thor. It is an assault upon everything in that tribe that is sacred and valued. An assault upon one woman is an assault upon all of us. That is something we should embrace. If we cannot value, a woman may not be out front and charge large and speaking and doing all of these wonderful things. We may never have a Tommy Lauren or any of these other powerful female spokespersons. Someday we will. But the women that we have now, if we cannot, as, as men, begin to truly value what they are to us, what they represent to us, and be worthy of something that is valuable to the community, we 
need to start figuring that out. That tale of Loki and the assault upon a feminine divide in that community is a is another, yet another powerful message of men that need to learn to grow and to develop. That entire community was owed shield. He had to pay the entire community for this crime that he committed. This is in direct opposition to Muslim communities where the woman is literally blacked out, not worth anything, maybe stones to death, traded sold, whatever. In our society of free men with justice and equality, right, all of a sudden they become much more valuable. That's something I want to see embraced as well. And don't get me wrong, I've, I've been married to a woman and my goodness, she needs an ass whooping more than any woman I ever met. <laughs> but you don't do that kind of stuff. You don't strike women, you don't, you don't assault them. When you do that, you're violating something that affects all of us. But now that woman has a scar. Now that woman has a pain. Now that woman has an uncertainty. Now there's damage done, and it is particularly heinous when it is a young girl. One of the greatest benefits we might do to this world is rectify that situation with a divine feminine. And it's going to take the courage of men to do it. And it's going to take some women standing up and saying, you don't get to treat me that way. Be that as it may, I'll probably be called a feminist for that. Probably be made fun of saying that about my wife or whatever. One of the last things we got to talk about is the Eager's Feast. Obviously a very important book to me. Uh, it was one of the books I read. I gave a presentation on it in uh, Kansas City, which somewhat protested. He's changed the venue and did it anyway. Eager's Feast is, is a real beautiful tale to tell the truth. The very first thing that happens when Loki walks into that dinner is Simma Fang is busting his butt. He is serving, he is hustling, he is making things happen, and the gods are heaping praise on him because he is not missing a beat. And Loki can't stand it. There's an individual getting more attention to him, but Loki's not going to serve anything. Loki's not going to do anything. He's not going to try to measure up. So he kills him right off the bat. Once again, the same kind of measure. He kills him. When we come across individuals in the world that are doing better than us, we do not try to assassinate their character. If they're doing evil and they're doing wrong and they're misleading and they're telling half-truths, we stomp it out with a quickness and, and authority. Let's say I look up to Matt or Justin or Paul or something like that. I'm not going to assassinate their character to get on their level. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to get my butt in shape. I'm going to go there and try to set a standard as I'm physically capable of. One of the great things about having the gifts that we have, having this faith to believe in ourselves and our ability to succeed, we can go try. My grandfather always said, can't never got anything done. Try got a whole hell of a lot done. And it's especially true with regards to this faith. Here is Loki killing the first, most best successful serving man at this feast because he can't stand that he's getting more attention than him. And when we do it in today's world, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Build success in the man next. So the gods run him all off, send him off. He comes back. Now, if you can't measure up to the standard that the people around you have met, one of the first things human nature is inclined to do is begin to take their inventory. Well, you really had all the, you had all, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you had all these friends and somebody loaned you money and you, you knew somebody in the company and you got that job and you didn't have to work as hard as I do, and, and I, I'm smarter than you, and all of these excuses. And that's exactly what we have. Not once when somebody's talking in that manner are they saying, you know what, maybe I should have tried harder. Maybe I should have put in an hour at the house. Maybe I should have studied a little more to ace that test. Maybe I should have. 
That means accepting responsibility for our actions. That means we adopt the ideas of industriousness and perseverance so that we might succeed. People are all different. Some people are going to be stronger than me. Some people will never be as strong as me. Some people will be as smart as me. Some people will never be as smart as me. But we all have that opportunity to accept the responsibility and the challenge to do so. Loki, as the uninspired human intellect, never does this. He sits down at the table at Eager's Feast and one by one goes to the gods and steals from them their divinity. He humanizes them for all to read. And if you are a foreign church, what would you want to do? You would want to humanize the divine aspect that has governed the lives of people for 10,000 years. And you would use the, the man at the edge of the crowd to do it. To once again steal the light of to steal the light of the sun from the world and that assembled host. Now the character assassination continues. And as we go through that feast, and as he assaults all of these gods and goddesses, each god takes a turn, or goddess takes a turn to stand up in defense of the other. Loki has no understanding of how the divine interact with each other. But that doesn't stop him from humanizing them and stealing the divine aspect that we have hold, held holy for such a long time. Now we've got to sift through that and get it back. Now we've got to overcome some of that and give them back their divinity, if such a thing is possible. It's no accident the fires of the human intellect reside around Freya's neck in the Brisingaman gym. But the goddess of love carries, the fi that carries this necklace that represents the fires of human intellect. It is a goddess that holds that key, not a god. When we look at this idea of Loki, and we look at individuals that decide that, well, you know, I really kind of understand him. I really kind of have a real clear view of how he interacts and how he fits in. And I've got probably pretty clear clarification of the, the heathen worldview because of him and, and so on and so forth. I would submit to you that you go through this conversation again and ask yourself, is that really the case? Is there really something there that this person might know that I don't? I'm speaking of you, of course. Is there some, what kind of life does this person live? Is it a successful life full of resounding successes materially, physically, emotionally, mentally? Or is it one full of excuses and maybe being a little bit on the edge? I'm a little bit cooler than you. Uh, I'm going to boost my ego more than you because, well, I kind of understand him better than you do. Oh, how so? What do you understand? These are the things that are, there's nothing more dangerous in the world, be it in the political or religious environment than a half truth. And I spoke all of this stuff today in an effort to kind of dash the idea of half truth that seems to weave itself through the crowd that we see gathered in social media settings. The only thing I've ever seen anything do is boost that person's ego so they might seem important without ever having to do any of the hard work of learning, putting it into action, or growing. And with that, I'm going to wrap that up uh, with, uh, with, I'm sure I could go on and on, but I'm trying to get fired up on that. But if anyone has any questions, you're more than welcome to turn off your mic, and uh, I'd be happy to answer them.